supply was cut to a third of its normal capacity. Industries shut down. Drinking water had to be boiled. Electricity was limited in West and South London. Main traffic arteries were cut off. The city's telephone system was jammed with nearly twice the normal volume of calls. Refugees continued to fill churches, schools, and military facilities. They were mostly pathetic. You know, they, they had lost everything, a lot of them. It's hard for anybody to realize just how, how bad this flood was. We all had to get shots for typhoid. My mother nearly died. <laughs> I think I was the only one in the family that managed to get all the shots because everybody was so ill, you know, with the shots. And of course, I think a lot of people were in shock. Three days after the flood, the weather turned warm. Londoners began returning to what remained of their neighborhoods. The damage was so widespread, it was impossible to tell what part of the city had suffered the most. Almost no one had blood insurance. An awful mess. <laughs> Terrible mess. All the furniture, people's furniture was put outside. And it, London West never looked so bad. <laughs> so terrible. The water came in so fast in the house that it lifted the gas stove enough to get the linoleum off the kitchen floor and shoot it up against the wall. And there it was, stuck in the mud on the wall when we got home. And the frying pan off the stove was in on the bed in the, in the downstairs bedroom. And of course, the one thing was you couldn't buy supplies to clean. Every hardware store in the area was all out of um, a cleaning supplies, brushes, mops, anything like that. And I mean, some people were just going around, you know, kind of begging pails and, you know, two or three neighbors using the one pail or the one brush because they didn't have anything else to work with. That part was really trying. The water had subsided, of course, except the basements were all full. So I went down with my father, and we had uh, rubber boots on. It must have been three feet of water in the basement. And I had previously been looking upstairs for the cat. Todd couldn't find it anywhere in the upstairs of the house. Didn't know how it could have gotten out because were, the doors were all locked, the windows were all locked. I took a step forward, following my father over to one side of him, and squashed this awful feeling as my foot went down, and air bubbles came up. And I said, Dad, I think I found poor old Toddles. So each time I put my head under the muddy water and brought that, it was one of my footballs. And it's sad because you can see what the house, what the possessions, what everything looks like, but just ruined, like not like a fire that's burnt up and destroyed, but just sort of ruined. One lady came in tears to my dad to see what he could do about it, and he's not a thing. Put it out in the yard and turn the hose on it, and that's the best you can do. Then you have to pray that we're going to have enough sunshine to dry it out, you know. Well, it looked perfectly lovely. The living room was set up as if Mrs. Federley was going to have tea. The Chesterfield was there, and the chairs, and the coffee table. But anyway, it looked simply lovely, it just looked like a picture, except that there was no walls. And it was like an old-fashioned dollhouse, where the whole front is a door, and you pull the door open like this, and you see the upstairs and the downstairs, and it's, it's all there, all furnished. That's exactly like the Federley house. The whole front was clean, gone. And the dining room table was, table, the tablecloth was still on it, breeze, just a little wafting in the breeze. I, can, I just couldn't believe it. Well, it's hard to describe how you feel when your mother and dad has lost everything and you've lost everything that you worked for because our house was a mess. There wasn't a thing in it any good. Really, there wasn't. I said he gave mother and dad $15 to fix the house, which Maybe in that day seemed like a lot, but it was nothing, really nothing to, to repair the damage that was done. We salvaged a lot of things and uh, washed them and 
put them in the kitchen, of course, and the very next day we came, they'd all disappeared. Someone had stolen them. Well, there was nothing much left to loot at my place. It was standing there, all the brick was all off the front, and off one side, nothing near but the framework. Great big gully underneath where you could see right in to the furnace pipes was gone, and the water pipe, and all the things that were there. The only bright spot for most Londoners occurred in early May, when the Rotary Club organized a benefit concert for flood victims. The demand for tickets was so great, a second show had to be scheduled. When we went in, we all got settled down, and they let us in away ahead of time, and we we're sitting there, and all of a sudden, there's Guy Lombardo, the curtain goes up, and he's playing Home Sweet Home. Why did they cry? Here's our homeboy, Guy Lombardo, coming home and playing Home Sweet Home for us. For all the flood people. I mean, we were sentimental, I guess, to think he'd do such a thing. London really wasn't that great to him, you know. I mean, we just took him as a matter of course. Property values in West London plummeted. It was said you could buy a home for $500. One woman said she would sell for 25. Families who had lost everything had to abandon hopes of retirement. Many husbands and fathers literally worked until they died. We were down and out again. My, my mother was, bless her soul, was a hard worker, so was my dad. But they'd been wiped out in the Depression, and they just got to London to start again when they got wiped out in the flood. So my mother had a theory. If you buy one thing and pay it off, then buy the next thing and pay it off. They can never take anything but one thing away from you. No level of government wanted to take responsibility for flood relief. West London families argued for months just to get their property taxes reduced. The provincial government of Mitchell Hepburn conducted a survey of the area's flood controls and then did nothing. Time was on Hepburn's side. Over the years, West Londoners lost interest in flood control. They convinced themselves that 1937 had been a fluke. Many families stayed in their old neighborhood. Nobody really wanted to move out. Uh, it seemed so unlikely we'd have another flood. But we'd heard there was one in 1883, I think. And you know that's a long time ago, and it'll probably be a long time before it happens again. But in 1947, the Thames River topped the breakwater, forcing another evacuation in West London. At a special meeting of city council, it became obvious that the only solution was to build a dam north of the city. This time, the politicians had no choice. In 1953, Fanshawe Dam was opened. A few months later, West London property taxes went up to help pay for it. The new dam also eliminated flooding dangers in the coves. Captain Gore, who apologized to his wife for not being able to save her, stayed on to see the area become a thriving residential community. He also lived to see a trailer park and a paint factory go up next door to his rifle ranges. Although Fred Kimes' house was only slightly damaged, he lobbied for river improvements. Unlike other areas of London, Bruffdale got them. The Thames was dredged, a dike was constructed, and the old mill race was filled in. Aubrey Federley vowed that the river would never harm his home again. He rebuilt his house on top of a concrete bunker, reinforced with steel beams. In the 1950s, many of his neighbors' homes were torn down to make way for new apartment buildings. Rather than sell the property to developers, Federley's widow slashed the price by several thousand dollars so a young family could buy it. The Federley house still stands today. Front Street never recovered from the flood. Many of the remaining residents moved their houses to new lots at their own expense. Over time, other homeowners moved away and renters moved in. Front Street was becoming a slum. As far as the press was concerned, Front Street didn't exist. London West was more important. There was maybe more houses over there. 
uh, London North they were interested in. But we always wondered, was, was it because we were poor people that it really didn't matter? Because we heard as much as anybody else did. Jim and Jeanette Butson stayed in their old neighborhood to the end. Their son-in-law cashed in his life insurance policy and bought his family a new home. He gave the Butsons his old house. The couple celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary there, and their 60th. Jim Butson died in 1958. Jeanette sold the house to the city five years later. In 1975, a real estate agent took this photo of what remained of Front Street. Within five years, the last houses were torn down and the land was turned into a park. You know, there's a lot of memories down there. You go down there now, you look down the street. I walk down and try to picture where the house was. And I go down and say, well, so and so lived here, so and so lived there, so and so lived there. And, uh, so, you know, it's, they're all gone now, but, but uh, you know, we had a good, we had a good life down there. But all of this was in London's future during the spring of 1937. On May the 12th, the city held a parade to celebrate the coronation of King George. Refugees were still living in churches. Many areas were without streetlights. Unemployed men were being put to work rebuilding the breakwater. Sightseers were clogging city streets. And in West London, Max Ferguson was still looking for his cat. We were missing for a week and we suddenly heard meows. This was the week after we'd been back in the house. And we had to knock out upstairs a huge hole. My father took a sledgehammer and smashed in, broke the whole wall, and there was a cat that came out, emaciated, but uh, it, it rallied and survived. 